the story that you were going through. And I, I know that you strongly encourage your students to tell their story in their sure work. Mm -hmm. That's a really important thing to communicate. Um, we were talking last night, I'll interject this here before we begin with Catherine, about the difference between sheltering in place mm -hmm. and migrating in place. Sheltering in place is what we've been asked to do. Right. And the word shelter gives some comfort as in shelter from the elements. I would imagine these works of yours would primarily be interior pieces rather than mounted outside of a structure. Correct. So they yeah. would be in, inside of architecture. And when you shelter in place, there is, there is some sense of confinement as if you're something is happening in the world around you from which you want to shelter from which you need to seek refuge so you're going inward as you did in the series but it's more for comfort and self-protection uh ellen elms and i were talking about the theme of migration for this year and i started thinking about migrating in place which is what I've been doing. And I think you do that too. A lot of artists, when they go inside, it's not something that's still. Right. The chatter doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. If you migrate inside, there's a whole new world that opens up because you're facing inner extremities. You're challenging yourself. You're getting yourself ready to say something. Any migration is a change of place. If it has to do with animals, birds, insects, it's a change of place. And it could be a seasonal thing, but it could be a catastrophic thing. Maybe there's a forest fire or maybe like that horrible fire in Australia and those animals tried to migrate from there. We see so many people trying to migrate. <clears throat> They're trying to get to a better place, a healthier place. And I know as an artist, I've migrated. I've been more active as an artist during this COVID experience than I have in the last 10 years because I've had this gift of time. And that's what I needed to do. In order to shelter in place, I had to migrate. I had to move from my outside existence inside. <clears throat> um, I think a lot of actors do that too. Yes. When can speak to that word, uh, migrating inside because actors take on other persona and they have to find things within themselves to identify with that and sometimes that's the reason for the projection of body adornment to let other people know maybe it's a symbolic gesture to right. let other people know yeah so Catherine tell us a little bit about your theatrical background so we can access what you're going to show us Okay. Um, hi. By the way, uh, um, I would like to reiterate what Rebecca and Linda and everybody else have said about thank you to all the tech people who are doing all this because it wouldn't work without them. Um, I am a theater artist, which means I am basically a storyteller. Um, I came to Common Ground uh, teaching-wise as a puppet maker because we had just done a show called Avenue Q, which is basically Sesame Street grown up for people who don't know that. Um, and I have continued on as something of a costumer. So when Linda started to tell us about what we were going to be talking about as clothing and costumes and body adornment, and my class right now is accessories. You cannot be fully dressed without an accessory, which Linda and her wonderful hats are always accessories. Uh, Rebecca and wearing her glasses on top of her head are accessories. <laughs> okay, I made her, uh, right now I don't have my glasses on on purpose. Um, I guess my dog is my accessory right now, which is why I keep looking down this way. Um, but seriously, or sillily, I don't know, we all need a little bit of levity right now. Um, as a theater person, um, actor, director, and costumer, I am essentially a storyteller. And I'm, sometimes I have to, within myself, help other people figure out what that story is. 
And so that's kind of where I'm going with this because right now as a costumer, which is what I'm focusing on here at, at Common Ground, how do you tell your story through the visuals you provide for somebody else? So we all know Linda and her fascinators. That's her part of her story that she's bringing that she likes to be fascinating. I'm sorry, but it works, Linda. It really does. <laughs> she does um, it <laughs> And she's always color coordinated somehow. She wears all sorts of different colors, even though I know her favorite color is aubergine. Um, but she is almost, she's got a fascinator for every color and every mood. And sometimes as a person, your costume reflects your mood. Sometimes it reflects what you have to do, like Rebecca's gloves that she wears when she's doing funky things with grout and stuff like that that you really don't want to put your hands on. So sometimes the costume is what you wear. So anyway, I looked up definitions is my usual way of going things. And I love the fact that the definition for clothing had the word clothing in it. I love that. Clothing is a piece of clothing. That doesn't help. Clothing is something you wear. A costume is something you wear that is either historically um, or and or um, ethnic specific or job specific or I would add theater specific. If you are doing a production of Romeo and Juliet, you don't want to put Romeo in green and Juliet in red because you get them visually together and they're going to fight. Okay, so it's a totally different kind of story and a totally different kind of adornment. Um, so that is part and part of part of that yeah, part and part of telling your story. I love the fact that all three people that are talking today are wearing blue or blue green. I think that's an interesting calming color that we're all doing. So everything you do tells a story. And when you are a theater artist trying to help that story be told to other people, which all artists do, it doesn't matter whether it's theater, visual art, even musical art, you tell a story, you tell a mood, you tell a something, um, you need to start thinking about how you want to tell that story. So that is that is what I do. That is who I am um, today, today. This week we are doing accessories. So I'm gonna turn around to show you if I can, if this works. Now I can't see my camera. There we go. Can you guys see him? Yep. yep. That's Sir, some incidental Roman. He's wearing a Renaissance floppy hat that my class made. This is a muffin hat that my class made. This is jewelry made out of lace, and this is armor made out of EVA foam, which is really easy to find. But this motif is very flowery because it's going to go on my Titania, who is kind of flowery and armory at the same time. So that's why I created that that way. So I don't know if that answers what Linda wanted me to talk about. Does it, Linda? Yes. Good. Could you, so, could you list, we started cataloging all kinds of body adornment. Just to right. so know how broad the, the scope of body adornment is beyond just clothing, shirts, pants, skirts, dresses, suits, beyond that, just catalog. Let's brainstorm a minute. Catalog a bunch of body adornment, like garters. Garters, hats. Your turn, Rebecca. My turn. My cow. I would have to say my cowboy hats. There you Absolutely. go. You know, I know you said hat, but it's got to be the cowboy boots. hat, like Linda's hats. Yeah, my For cowboy days. boots also. Yeah, Absolutely. reflect my mood, a job I have to do, a task that's coming up. I need them. I need them. Pam Zapardino and I started Jackets Anonymous a few years ago because we just. <laughs> We, uh, we have a problem uh, collecting jackets. And they, they <laughs> range in scale from little boleros uh, to full-blown three-quarter or full-length coats. Right. And now I understand gloves are back in, not, not just the little church. Not just the little half ones. Yeah, I've seen that too. The gloves and the gauntlets and all those are really in this season. Yep. And, and in addition to the hats, you've got hat bands, you've got tiaras, you've got crowns. You've got masks. Oh, baby, do you have masks? I love the, the Swiss are now taking photographs 
of their faces and making them into masks. So oh, wow. Masks, so it looks just, like their face. It looks like their face. Their lips just don't move what? when they talk. But when you look at them, Walter says it's all the rage. He said there's some Swiss guy that's making a, a That's family. hilarious. Making I have one that's, a, that's from one of my t-shirts. It's a Monet. And so I wear a Monet on my face. <laughs> that's um, funny. I saw one that looked like hands, looked like yeah. like or like. Oh, I like that one. I haven't seen that one. I've seen a lot of emojis. I've seen a lot of emoji ones. I think um, the predominant masks are like the athletic fan masks. And yeah. like Governor Hogan, bless his soul, he's doing a good job bringing us through all this. He wears the Maryland masks, and he's got just about every Maryland mask that's been, right. been made. Yeah, that, that's, that's pretty cool. But yeah, so accessories can be anything. Rings, bells, rings on your fingers and bells on your toes. Castanets. Castanets, lovely <laughs> necklaces like Linda makes and earrings that Linda makes. Um, you know, uh, belts, vests, belts, vests of all kinds, ponchos. Anything yeah. you don't have to wear to just cover your body so that it's warm to me is an accessory. So like you said, your jackets, your vests. It was interesting to me going through my grandmother's early in my grandmother's days. <coughs> she had things she and her sisters used to wear. Right. And because they didn't wash their dresses as often as we wash our clothes. They had interchangeable collars and cuffs. Right. Wow. So a company, yeah. they take off their aprons and quickly change their collars and cuffs and look very prim and clean. Right. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I know. It so works. In body adornment, we're talking pretty much about a freestanding, three-dimensional human body onto which we add accessories that we call body adornment. So in Rebecca's sculpture, in the mosaic part of it, that's her adornment. She's taking a cast of an actual life-size human body and she's adorning it. Both of you are telling stories with your work and both of you um, have talked a little bit about color. And in telling your story, you're using color to bring about a certain mood, a certain kind of feeling. You want to discuss that a little bit more. Okay, I'm going to um, let Rebecca start because I have to go untangle my dog. Okay. <laughs> well, for me, I'm, I go beyond um, color. Linda, I go, I, I go into texture. So, um, and, and also the strength of the material because what that material is made out of slate versus silk rose petals tells a very different story. So, um, and the texture of the slate, it, it presents strength, but it also is rough. And slate, as far as density in the stone world goes, it's somewhat fragile because it can, it, it's very thin layers that um, can be easily broken apart. So I, I think there's a, there's a lot of duality when I, when I choose materials. Um, I just want it to say so many things to so many people. I know what I'm saying, but because of those choices, I think it allows for the viewers a more open experience. They don't have to be pigeonholed into feeling a certain thing when they look at my work. So and I think the material choice, color, uh, density, texture, all of that allows for that action to happen. Yeah, I like that, Rebecca. That's a, a good point that as an artist, you know what you want to say, but you also have to be open to other people's interpretation or there's no point to the art. There's no point of any art if it can't be shared, in my yeah. opinion. Um, yeah. Whether it be something for the theater, something for a grand gallery, something to wear on your body, there's no point to it if it can't be shared. Right, so, and interpreted. And interpreted. In a different way, so yep. yeah. So. You've alluded to edges and how important the 
edge is in in getting across your idea and the the comparison of the slate and the rose petals is pretty significant mm -hmm. because as you cut the slate it it's got a rough edge and they were sort of leaf like shaped and pointed so you're you're dealing with symbols from the natural world but the way that the viewer interprets that is totally different exactly the jagged edge than the smooth edge of the rose petal right sure and of course on a real body um catherine's going to be very uh particular about the edge because more than likely that's going to touch the body where it's been right where it's going to be but, you know, it also depends upon how you sculpt something. A lot of the things that we're working with for this class are is EVA foam. And EVA foam can be pointed. You can um, cut it in a way and then put it together so that it is actually edgy. Like a lot of the people are, the Ellis's in particular, are making armor. And so that's going to be very sharp looking. But then, of course, as somebody has to wear it they have to be able to wear it so it can't be pokey in the wrong right. places um so as much as i love rebecca's beautiful slate body i wouldn't want to wear that <laughs> me either I'm but done. that's kind of the point you it don't want to wear it right you know you don't right. want anybody to have had to have worn it and right. sometimes with a costume you have to do both you have to make it so that it looks sharp and pointy like you have to make it look Look like metal um but it can't be real metal and then of right. course there's a lovely theatrical if you have somebody in armor and they have to run and make noise you have to make a sound effect for them right. because eva foam does not clink right it's about the illusion to tell yep. the story not the actual material itself when it's a costume yeah so, yeah. so, so as you're triggering a sensual response from your viewer whether they're in the audience and the wearer of your body adornment is on the stage or whether your viewers in the audience and your artwork is on a pedestal in a museum you're creating an illusion that triggers a sensual response and i always say that the the eye of the beholder is mm -hmm. very overrated that's that's like blown out of proportion to the other senses because those other senses can be triggered by the the kinds of illusions you're creating as artists the jagged edge versus right. the smooth, the smooth. Edge creates an illusion in the mind of the beholder they have fingers in their minds they have a, a sense of touch a mental sense of touch and they have experience touching rose petals they have experience touching a rock that's right rough. yeah so as they see those edges which you're putting together to express your passion your story you're doing it so that the viewer will successfully and sensually feel what you're expressing absolutely yeah that's very well put linda thank you mm -hmm. so because we've been talking about uh life-size scale rebecca do you have any other mosaics in your studio would you like are you able to show us a little of your studio that's been so hard for you to access <laughs> um, we, we're calling her rev the tenacious a lot of, yeah, a lot of my mosaic sculptures are in the main house. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, sorry about that. That's all right. <laughs> that's all right. Um, it happens. We're coming from uh, a historic perspective from both of you. Um, Rebecca, you spent time in Italy. Did you spend time in Greece? uh not not doing artwork just to visit but i i was on um four grant um proposals that i wrote and studied four times under byzantine mosaic master so that was awesome mm -hmm. and one of the the four i was able to take an eight-day tour um in sicily hitting all wow pertinent Byzantine work. So that that was really incredible. Although I was not studying with the master, 
of course, anything you see like that becomes part of you. You take it home and it does become part of your work. So yeah, awesome. Really I know awesome. That, that you teach from, from that point of view too, um, that mo mosaics are a very rugged art form. A lot of that area of the world is physical, yeah, volcanic, yes, and yeah. mosaics have a greater chance of living through uh, surviving, surviving sure. uh, right. volcanoes, and also with the humidity and the moisture in that country, um, they were so into the tradition of baths, and with the steam and the moisture and stuff. Paintings just didn't last and mosaics survived. That's correct. You want to yeah. talk a little bit about the difference between um, mosaic work, sculptural work that is interior versus sculptural work that's exterior? Sure. I have um, a bit of both, um, as you know. And Michael was sitting here and he held up my mosaic couch, which I don't even think, mm -hmm. Linda, you've ever seen. Um, so when I was teaching at York College, we bought the house that, that we're currently in and there was a cast iron bathtub and we were redoing the bathroom. So of course it had to become something other than a bathtub or discarded. So it became a mosaic couch. So let me know if you can see that okay. Oh, yes. Yep. So that is a full size couch. The bathtub is the base upside down. Uh, I, we screwed sheets of plywood on the back and cut it with a jigsaw so it looked like the curve of the couch and the actual cushions and the arms are construction insulation that uh, Linda you're familiar with that I make my sculpture students use that when they carve that for their garden sculptures and we carved it with rasp and and little saws to make that concrete couch look like a soft I just love the throw blanket I just love the blanket you love the throw blanket yeah I just think it's perfect symbol on it I don't know if yep. you can see that yep and the um Spartan is their mascot so those Spartans were done with an advanced technique called the indirect method where um two of my advanced students did them on mesh in the studio the rest was done direct method on site after we wrapped that couch in wire mesh and an inch of concrete so the cool thing about exterior um mosaics um, they're permanent or they should be permanent anyway and they become part of the landscape and they are become if you will a piece of uh, in this case it is a functional piece of art because you could sit on that couch and at graduation time the lines were very long to get your picture with say. your parents sitting on the York College um, couch. So another exterior mosaic that I did, uh, this is only the top of it. Um, there you go. Yeah. The top, it's a mosaic totem pole that was a dead tree um, on the property of our cabin on the Potomac. And uh, we wrapped it with uh, plastic, Michael and I, wire. I did an inch of concrete. The head of the eagle is carved out of a stump that we lag bolted into the top of the dead stump. Um, and it has three registration bands. One has a black bear, one has a buck, and the base is that beautiful slate that I used on Provabito. And I actually made, um, roots almost going in, into the ground where it meets the ground um, on the property and I covered it all with slates in the same style that I layered it on Prohibito so it looks like wood. So the cool thing about exterior mosaics, they're public. More people can view them versus interior mosaics that are in my house or things that might hang on a gallery wall etc so they both have their place they are both extremely important for what they bring uh to to others whether it be the community or, or people that are visiting in a gallery or in your home so i like them both for different reasons i like the collaborative nature of large-scale mosaics um, because it takes a lot of people to pull that off for the totem pole 
it was Michael and I, it's what happens when you take the artist and somebody that is incredibly talented as far as building and um, making things that give me the substrate that I need to make something I never would be able to create without his knowledge and um, his skill. So um, it's a beautiful combination that we have. And the Mosaic Couch, it was two different classes. It took us a whole semester. It was a sculpture class and my mosaic class. And the beautiful thing about that, the sculpture students were so fine tuned on creating the 3D form. Um, and they also helped with the mosaic process, but not so much the mosaic students helped with the building of the armature. So, um, but it, it, it came out really well and they did a really good job. And um, it, it's, there's so many hands on that piece that, um, it just gives me goosebumps when I look at it. So, proud of that. Fantastic, and you should be. And, and that's a wonderful sense of community that you've created, and a piece that's that's meaningful. Uh, where you've installed it, it continues to be meaningful because it has all the symbols of the college on it. Right. Exactly. It's site specific. It's so. got humor. It's got comfort. It's yeah. got style. <laughs> it's got function. Yeah. Uh, wonderful piece. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate all the efforts that the two of you have made to make teaching online possible for your fan base. Uh, some of you <laughs> so why did I get spotlighted there for a second? I'm like, what? Do you, <laughs> on. Do you have returning students? Yes, yes. I do. Mm-hmm. Yep. Actually, Rebecca and I share a student. Oh, we do? Who? Becky Ellis. Oh, she's a repeat offender. Linda, yep. my repeat of, she's the third time around for, for yep. Becky. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's, yep. It's a we joy. You can't get enough of common ground. That's great. Yeah. You know, the, the, Ellis, the Ellis's are great. But yeah, Becky's been in my class more than once as well. So yeah, it's, it's they're, pretty they're fun. They're assets to the classroom. Or the other students that are first time arounders. So yeah, yeah, and I put them on the spot purposely. You know, <laughs> what do we do when this happens, Becky? Okay. Right. And she she's right there. She's right there on everything, and she pulls up images somehow. I don't know how to do it on Zoom of projects she created in my class that somebody had a question about, and it's right, right on the screen. I don't know how to do it, but I'm glad she does. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, sorry about the barking dog in the background. That's my beagle. That's okay. It's okay. So well, that's fantastic. We we really appreciate all that you've gone through to make teaching online possible mm -hmm. and accessible. Both of you have uh, popular classes, and and uh, your your students are benefiting from your instruction, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Well, thank, thank you for, you the, for opportunity the opportunity and, and all the support, because it wouldn't work otherwise. So thank you exactly. for, it's, thank yep. you, as Rebecca said, for not giving up, Linda, because yeah. <laughs> I'm serious. Redefined in capital letters. Is That's so right. <laughs> yeah. Thank yep. you so much. Well, I appreciate our audience tuning in and for the audience that not is not with us live streaming, enjoy right. this when, when you can see it, it will be available on our sites. I'd like to invite you tomorrow night. Uh, we're having an evening of fiber with Joanne Bost with uh, Carly uh, doing the braided class, her braided cool. class is huge. Um, Nancy McKenzie is, is my new hero. Uh, we had a terrible accident with Angie Muller. Um, she's having surgery uh, Ooh. and um, she fell and, and broke and cracked and fractured. <gasps> oh my gosh. So at, at the final hour, so. Um, right. Yeah. Mary Lou Grout happened to know Nancy McKenzie, who's married to a guy that was in school with Walt and I, and she <laughs> is an avid knitter and has popped in and is teaching that very popular knitting class. Cool. And Lisa Weaver Denning. So there'll be four talking tomorrow, specifically about fiber. On Thursday night, we have Sasha Lane. She's been coming to Common Ground. Uh, this is her first year teaching with us. And she is a storyteller. 
she does portraits that talk in novellas and full mm. novels. Wow. They're remarkable, remarkable portraits. And we have Phil Grout, who's so popular, we have to have him teaching all week. <laughs> all, all three week. weeks. <laughs> and all his classes were some of the first to Phil. Um, Phil is, has been a photojournalist for many decades. And uh, the two of them are going to share uh, our Thursday evening spot. Of course, uh, any of you with questions can enter them in chat. Okay. We're not uh, reacting live with our audience this time, but if the audience right. has questions for any artist, they can enter them in the Zoom chat. And okay. Carol and I will look at those questions and address them to the artists who were speaking. Cool. Good. For those of you who haven't uh, become aware of the fact that it's gonna be very difficult for us mm -hmm. to assemble a student art show on each of the Friday evenings. Yeah, so Maria yeah, it's a shame. Wong has come up with an idea of how that's going to work. So any instructors or students who are listening, um, you're going to be responsible for taking the best photos you can, get tips from Phil, get tips from Sasha, mm -hmm. uh, use good light, frontal lighting is very important, frame your piece well, and send those photographs to Maria and our miracle maker is going to turn them into a student art show for cool. all three weeks. And that will be available to view for the rest of the summer. Oh, and nice. then that will be archived so that the work is readily available. And we're finding one of the perks of going digital is the fact that it can be accessed anytime by right. people in any time zone. Right. Sure. So we have friends from Scotland who are six hours difference in time, friends in Switzerland who are six hours difference in time who can access these videos that Rex and others are so uh, talented that they can archive them on our right. YouTube and right. Facebook website. Very good, that's great. So we're actually creating a little bit of history here with this is the first digital one and with the ability to record what's going on. Yeah, so sure. The evening performances, of course, the keynotes will all be archived. Um, we found it difficult to have our musicians jam. I wasn't up long enough to go to the gazebo last night, but some of you late night outs may go to the gazebo. That's what we're calling our late night jam. And basically it's an open mic. So starting cool. at 10 o'clock, if any of you are interested in reading a poem, telling a story, playing an instrument, playing a particular song that you wrote, that's happening at 10 o'clock every night. And, and the, the site is called the gazebo. So gotcha. you just go there Perfect. and it will open, open for you. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank I you, Linda. You thank you, Rebecca. Thank, thank you for sharing. You, Continue. We'll, I miss you. Together next time. Yep. Hey, all hey, right. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you. All right. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Rex. Thank you. Bye-bye.